Timothy chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse number 10. We're continuing in this series, This is Important. It's out of the book of 2 Timothy. It's Paul's last letter that he wrote. I do want to encourage you to be back with us tonight. As Pastor said, 6.30 service tonight. I'll be preaching again on Psalms 14. If you're disappointed with my preaching this morning, give me a second chance. I usually do better the second time around. And so, uh, but join us tonight. We'll be in Psalms chapter 14. And we'd love to have you back out to enjoy the presence of God again tonight. Let's read from 2 Timothy 3 verses. 10 through 15, and then we're going to get right into the depths of this word this morning. And it reads like this, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, say the word all, Say it again. And out of them all the Lord <clears throat> delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Here Paul is writing to this young pastor Timothy in the city of Ephesus and we've been in this series since May of 2019. Not that I'm that slow at it but I do only preach it once a month while I'm in the pulpit. And uh, we're up to the point where Paul had just explained in the first nine verses when we were together last time, we looked at this coming apostasy. He talked about in the last days there will be perilous times and we talked about about the fact that we are in the last days. We've been in the last days. And he spends a great deal of time in those nine verses of describing what the culture will look like outside the church and what was happening inside the church with false teachers and uh, all of the false doctrine that was being propagated and even believers that were hosting such teachers and false doctrine and all that that entailed. And if, if you only stopped in verse number nine, it would seem very bleak. It'd almost be like if Paul stopped right there and quit writing and be like, okay, well that was good to know information and obviously we got a problem, but what are we supposed to do about it? What are we supposed to do? In this time that you and I live in today, Paul is sharing with us in these brief verses here, actions that you and I can take in the midst of false teachers, in the midst of false doctrine, in the midst of perilous times in these last days that we're living in. He gives us these actions that you and I can take that are important to us in being able to not only confront false teaching and false teachers, but also not to fall prey to false teachers and false teaching. And so let's look at them together. Three actions in three words to help you and I live godly in this godless world. Let's look at it together. Beginning in verse number 10, the first word I want to give you is remember. The first thing Paul calls on this pastor and us today by extension is to remember. Remember two things specifically. Number one is this. Remember faithful examples. Remember faithful examples. In verse number 10, right out of the chute, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, but you have carefully followed my, and then he makes a list, doctrine, manner, life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, persecution, perseverance rather, persecutions and afflictions. You and I must remember faithful examples. Paul is giving Timothy here an example of him ministerially and personally. He's saying to this young man, because you have to remember Timothy is a spiritual son in the faith. Timothy joined officially the ministry of Paul uh, at around, around the beginning of his second missionary journey. So that would have been 14 years previous to this. Odds are he had to be 16 to follow Paul uh, as an official intern. So he's probably 30 plus years 
most theologians agree with. But the way Paul talks to him and calls him a spiritual son, the fact that he knows his mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois, and all of these other very personal facts, odds are he has known Timothy much longer than that, probably back to the very early years of his life. And Paul knew him, and Paul is saying this to him, look, Timothy, you have been careful to follow these things. And in these perilous times, you must be careful. You must remind yourself to still follow the right things, to still follow the right examples, to still follow in the direction that you should be going. And every one of us as believers in Jesus Christ, I, I have the distinct privilege and honor of being able to address leaders. I coach leaders in the ministry, young pastors. I was on the phone with a pastor this week for a couple hours. It's going through a very challenging time with they launched into a building program and then COVID hit and they've got obligations and, and just a lot. And he's a young guy. This is all brand new to him and trying to coach with him and work with him through all of these things. And in the midst of all of these things, I was reminded of this text this morning, which reminded me of this. Every one of us, not just preachers, not just the Pauls and the Timothys and the Silases of the world, not just believers that are on church boards or run Sunday school ministries or anything else. All believers should have three people in their life that are very critical. And I want to share them here, here because Paul is talking in the context of being a mentor to someone that he's mentoring. Every one of us at all stages in our life as a believer in Jesus Christ should have three people in your life. Number one, you should have a Paul in your life or a Pauline if you're a woman. A uh, Paul or a Pauline in your life. You need to have someone that's mentoring you. Someone that has been where you have not gone yet as a believer in Jesus Christ. The best and easiest place to find that is in church. Someone who's walked with God longer than you walked with God. Someone that has seen the ebb and flow of false teaching that tries to come against the church. Those that have lived through some things in life that have really had to put their personal faith to the test. And it's important that all of us have that Paul in their life. I have one in my life now. I've always had a mentor in my life from the very beginning of my ministry. Many of those mentors over the years have become peers of mine. Uh, but I've always had, and even to this day, I have someone that's in front of me in the ministry, someone I can follow, someone that is an example that I can run after and go in that direction. He's been somewhere where I haven't been before. A second person you need in your life is a Barnabas, is a Barnabas. Everybody needs one. Barnabas, the very definition of the name Barnabas is son of encouragement. This is a peer. You need a Paul, which is a mentor. You need a Barnabas in your life. This is a peer. This is an iron sharpened iron kind of relationship. I love this kind of a relationship right here with our pastor, Dan Wakefield. It's no secret. We're best friends, have been for over two decades. I love that about our relationship. We have this iron sharpening iron, this encouragement toward one another, this, this uh, edifying one another, all of that. You need a Barnabas in your life, someone that you can have a coffee with, someone you can call up and have them pray for you over a situation that you're going through in your life, someone that'll celebrate with you, the things that are going on in life. You need that kind of a relationship in your life. And the third one is this, a Timothy. Everyone, every believer in Jesus Christ should have someone following them. You should have someone that you're mentoring in the faith. The Bible's even very clear. Paul wrote about it, that the older leaders, lead, the older women in the church should instruct the younger women in the church. Paul talked about the younger, the older men being examples to the younger men. You and I must do that. And the best way, again, to find that is in the church, to be available, to be that married couple that's been down the road and have, have gone through a lot of things in your marriage and to be there for that young couple, young in their faith and young in their marriage that they think at this point with three small children, all they're ever going to do is pay bills, pick up toys and change dirty diapers, you know. They need to hear from you that they will get through that, that they're faith can help them make it where 
they need to in their marriage to one another. You see, Paul here in giving this idea, encouraging you and I to remember faithful examples, is a good place to remind us of the kind of relationships that should be in our life. And please don't sit there and listen to the enemy or your own insecurities and think that you have nothing to offer. It is not true. You have something to offer. There are people that need to hear from you, to be encouraged by you, someone that you can be vulnerable with and be able to share with someone struggling the struggles you had and how you got through it and to encourage them to go further down the road with Jesus Christ. So Paul here is saying to remember faithful examples. Then he also goes on to remind Timothy of this and to remind us today too, and that is this, remember our faithful God. It's important that we remember our faithful God in perilous times, in the last days, you and I must remember our God. Listen to how Paul put it in verse number 11. He says, persecutions and afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecution I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered me. This is an echo of what Paul said in chapter 2 2 verse 11 and 13. Remember when Paul said this? This is a faithful saying. If we are faithless, he, speaking of God, remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. I have a good reminder for you this morning about our faithful God, and that is this. God's faithfulness is not predicated on our faithfulness. God will always be faithful whether we are or not. God will always keep his word. God will always do what he said he would do. God will always be there in the moments he said he would be there. God's word is always true whether I choose to believe it or not, whether I choose to live it or not. God is a faithful God. And Paul was saying in these perilous times, we must remember that the God that was good to you in the good times is the same God. God that will be even greater to you in your difficult times. He's the God that will be right there with you. And Paul didn't want us to forget this in these perilous times. When I got to this point in my study, and I, I've shared uh, times before, I believe, but I, I'm still kind of old school. I have computer software, but I'm kind of old school. I go into my study, have my prayer time, my Bible, and I work from there on my messages with a legal pad next to me and an ink pen and, uh, and a highlighter. And I begin with the text that I know God's gave me and I work from there. And when I got to this part, I got real excited when I was thinking about the faithfulness of God because I began thinking about how faithful in these 30 plus years of being, 32 now, plus years of ministry that God has had me in, how he's been faithful every single step of the way. And then to think about all of these 34 plus years now of serving the Lord where God came into my life and delivered me from addiction and delivered me from my sin and set his Holy Spirit into my life and how he's been faithful over the years. And all of these verses started running through my mind. Songs started running through me. I started thinking of the first time I remember singing that great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God. I mean, and what that song means to me. And then all these verses that came along. Listen to a few of them. Listen to just a little bit of the biblical record of the faithfulness of God. Here are just a few things. Number one, God is faithful to forgive give. Um, well, that was kind of like a wave. I got one over here and then another one over here and then these three said I'll join in and that kind of a thing, you know. God is faithful to forgive. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 verse number 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful to us when we're tempted. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man, but God is faithful. And then he goes on and says this, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God is faithful to his word, to his promises that he makes to you and I. Hebrews 10, 23 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. 
faithful. Uh, the Bible also says that God's faithful to establish and guard you in your life. It says in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful who will establish and guard you from the evil one. And I love this verse out of Deuteronomy. It shows us that God is faithful to a thousand generations. Listen to these words. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Somebody say amen if you believe in the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. Most Christians, even in their lowest, most difficult time in life, believe that God is faithful. But I want us to grab the specifics of this aspect Paul's talking about of God's faithfulness. That is this. God is faithful to us and will deliver us from and by all persecution. What do I mean by that? Let me explain it to you this way. Paul is saying to a young pastor here that I have been persecuted. He lists Antioch, Lystra, and Iconium. He listed those specific places because that's where Timothy grew up at. Timothy knew those areas. Those also happened to be the areas, one of which where Paul was stoned and left for dead. Uh, Timothy knew what difficulties Paul went through during that time. And Paul was trying to show him an example. God that was with me then is the God that is with me now. The same God that delivered me before is going to deliver me now. But you have to keep this in mind. Paul was well aware that he was about to give his life for his faith. Paul was well aware that he was about to be martyred because of his faithfulness to God and his commitment to preaching the Word of God. Paul knew that that was coming. So he needed this young pastor not to be discouraged, not to get his idea of deliverance all twisted up, and instead he wanted him to understand that sometimes God delivers you from your persecution, but sometimes God delivers you by the persecution. What that means is this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were being faithful to God, they said to the king this in Daniel 3, verses 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, this has been settled in my life a long time ago. This has been settled in my life a long time ago that no matter my circumstances, I'm going to trust God. No matter what happens in my life, I'm going to follow God. No matter what this world throws at me, I'm going to believe in God. No matter what happens, this king has already been settled. Christians that make it through temptation and persecution and grow through temptation and persecution are those who have made their decision long before persecuted and long long before tempted, that no matter what, I will serve the Lord. No matter what, I will trust the Lord. The time of your persecution is not the time to make your decision that you're finally going to get, get it in cement that you're going to follow God. You make that in advance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did that. Then they went on and said this. If that is the case, speaking about their punishment, they, he, they were told that if they did not bow, they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. And they said this. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the, God, the gold image which you have set up. They were saying this. If the fire, if we're delivered from it, and we're not burned up by it, and God delivers us from it, God is faithful. But if he chooses the fiery furnace to bring me into his presence, God is still faithful. God will deliver you from persecution sometimes, but there are some through martyrdom, there are some through persecution that are delivered by the persecution, by their commitment that in the midst of facing a fiery furnace, a lion's den, or the fact that you will be crucified or killed rather for your faith, for being a faithful apostle, no matter what it is, God still delivers, whether it's by the, de the death for your faith or 
or whether it's by living out your faith through the persecution. And Paul wanted to be sure this young pastor knew that. And listen to me. I want me in my life, and I also want this for you in your life, to be the kind of example that we are the ones that do not give up, we do not give in, and we do not give over to the enemy in the times of our persecution. I want to be the example that you can follow. I want you to be the example that other people can follow. I want us to be the ones that say this morning, Jonathan, that's me. In these last days, in the perilous times, I will live a life worthy of being followed. I will live a life that when new believers are found in this church, when they get saved, that they can follow me and they will find Jesus Christ. They can follow me and they will not only survive their faith in their faith, but they will thrive in their faith and they will grow closer and closer to God. I want that this morning. How about you? I want that kind of a life. And Paul was saying in these last days, in these perilous times, when sometimes it seems like the enemy and it seems like false teachers are more popular than the church, that they have a larger crowd than the church, that they have a larger ministry in the church. Paul said this, in those moments, remember your faithful examples, those that are doing it right, and remember that God is faithful. God is going to keep his word. Second word of action that Paul gives you in this morning. First one was remember. Number two is this, realize. Number two is realize. Look at it in verses 12 and 13 with me. Verse 12 first, and he says this, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul is saying that you and I must in these perilous times and last days realize, what do we to realize two things. Number one, we must realize the godly will suffer. Well, I even got fewer amens on that one. I didn't expect any anyways, but I mean, you know, who wants to jump up and shout and go, yeah, that's me, man. We'll sign up for a potluck, but there's not much of a line to sign up for suffering. I'll bring a casserole, but don't expect me to let people ridicule me. I'll show up at the next church dinner at Jose Pepper's, but don't let me stand up in the face of persecution and declare my faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says in these last days that we're living in, perilous times that we realize right now in the United States of America is going on, that in those moments, you and I must realize the godly will suffer. Nothing that we can do about it. What he's saying is this. You desire to live godly, guess what? Hand in hand with that. Immediately what is coupled to that and what comes with that is that you will suffer persecution for desiring to live godly. What's the aim of all believers in Jesus Christ? To be like Christ. To be ye holy for I am holy. For us to live a godly life. So if that is our pursuit and our aim while living on this earth, we must realize, recognize, and be ready for that means that we will be persecuted. We will be. There's nothing that can be done about that. Not a thing. It's going to happen. We have gotten this idea of Christians and suffering all twisted in the church today. How do I know that? Because of the Christian joy boys that are on your Christian television that preach that if you have real faith, if you really believe in God, that you will have cash, Cadillacs, and comfort. And if you don't have those things, you're not a man or woman of great faith. And the Bible teaches the exact opposite. This is why the counseling rooms of pastors' offices around this nation are packed with people, disheartened people, discouraged people, because they went to these conferences, they bought the books, they bought their sermons, they gave to these ministries, and they can't understand why life is difficult for them. Because they were promised a bill of goods that God never promised and that God never guaranteed you. Pastor, I can't believe this is happening to me. What's happening to you? I cannot believe that because I am a Christian that my job is in jeopardy. To which on the inside, though I, I try to be compassionate, but it's why pastor doesn't let me counsel. 
of which on the inside, I'm like, really? You're surprised by that? <laughs> I mean, if only at one verse, I can give you just one verse so to say, because you decided to be a Christian. This life is going to have troubles and trials. It's going to be difficult. It's going to come your way. You see, the Bible even indicates that suffering for God is a something to actually rejoice about. Acts, I knew you were going to ask. The book of Acts, I know you're looking for chapter and verse. I'll give it to you. Acts chapter 5 tells us the story of the apostles and the early church. We know all the background. I don't want to get into it because I love that passage of Scripture and we'll be here for 10 minutes. And at this moment, I don't have that in this message. But in Acts chapter 5, and I believe in your study guide, I did give you the actual reference for it. In the end of Acts chapter 5, we find that the disciples had not only been persecuted, beaten for their faith in Acts four and told not to preach in the name of Jesus and they were beaten for it. They went to the church, prayed, Holy Spirit fell and they kept preaching, being obedient to God, sharing the word of God. They kept being obedient to God, which meant they'd be disobedient to man, but it was better to obey God than it is to obey man. So they kept going with this. Acts chapter five tells us the same thing, that many signs and wonders were being done by the church. Many people were still being added to the church. The religious leaders got mad and arrested them. Guess what God did? God sent an angel and delivered them out of the jail. When they got delivered out of the jail, they got arrested again and brought back in. And they were trying to figure out all that was going on. One of the disciples finally spoke up and said, it's better for us to obey God than it is to obey man. Then the Bible says this in uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 40 through 42. It says then that they beat them for their faith, telling them not to share their faith anymore, and then release them. Okay? And this is what it says about that encounter. It says in verse 42, rejoicing, speaking of the disciples, they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They considered perse being persecuted for their faith something to praise God about. You know why I think they felt that way about it? I think they felt that way about it because they were like, we're on the right path. We truly are doing what God wants us to do. Jesus said this was going to happen, and it happened. Check it out. He said that if we were going to follow him and be faithful, we'd be dragged before kings, and then we'd be falsely accused, and we'd be persecuted. And guess what? I must be getting so close to Jesus that the devil can't stand it. So close to Jesus that the demons are angry. So close to Jesus that the religious can't handle it. And because of the persecution, I know I'm on the right path, headed in the right direction. And they actually took joy in it. Jesus did the same, facing the cross. The Bible describes that it was the joy that was placed before him. Not that he wanted to be beaten and the crown of thorns and to suffocate and to have a sword stuck into his side on the cross. That wasn't what the joy was about. The joy was about what it would bring about. And persecution will bring about in your life if you cling to God greater faith, a depth of intimacy with God, and a brighter witness than you could have ever gotten on your own trying to straddle the fence to please man and please God. Remember, you and I must realize that the godly will suffer in these last days of persecution. I love one of the statements our pastor said recently, and he was talking about the fact that how people have taken uh, this fear and they've latched onto it of everything that's going on in our culture now, and the fact that if we as believers in Jesus Christ can't push through this little bitty thing called COVID now, you better hope God is a pre-tribber because you're not gonna fare well in the tribulation. You see, you and I must realize we are going to suffer. Nobody wants to hear that. None of it, I, half of you are probably sitting here going, okay, I see in the study guide you're getting onto one that sounds a little bit better. Let's get on to that point. Okay, let's go on to the next point. Not only are we to realize that the godly will suffer persecution, number two, we must realize the godless will worsen. The godless will worsen. See, you thought it was going to get better, but it's not. 
Listen to verse number 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Evil in these last days will only get worse. Listen to me. There is no Christian utopia on the way on this earth. God never called us to pray for it. God never promised it. God did promise that He would be with us in the fiery furnace, though. God, of our lives, our figurative fiery furnace. God did promise that He'd never leave us nor forsake us. God did promise a place in heaven if we stay faithful to Him. God did promise that He would give us His Word. God did promise we'd have the power of the Holy Spirit. He promised a lot of things, but He did not promise us a Christian utopia on this planet called Earth. Instead, He prophesied through His Word what we are seeing with our own eyes and hearing through the television waves and radio waves in our, life, in our culture today. The times will get worse and worse in the the last days, that these evil doers will worsen deceiving and being deceived. The third word I want to give you this morning, we must remember, remember, number two, we must realize, number three, we must recommit. We must recommit. Recommit to what? Two things. Recommit to what you know. In these last days and perilous times, you and I must recommit to what we know. Look in verse number 14 as we finish marching through this passage of Scripture. Paul says this, But you, what's that word but there for? He's contrasting again all of the difficulties that had gone on, these evil imposters that were listed in the previous verse right there. So he's saying in comparison and contrast to them, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. You and I daily actually must recommit to what we know is true. To what we know is true. That's what Paul's calling him here to. In fact, Paul goes on with it. And next time I'm with you in November, we're going to finish out this chapter in verses 16 and 17. But Paul goes on in verse 16 to remind you and I primarily what we need to remind ourselves of regularly is God's word. That it'll lead us. It'll guide us. It'll comfort us. It will empower us. Simon Peter called them the words of eternal life. The prophet in the Old Testament said that God's word was like honey in a honeycomb and he found it and ate it and it was sweet and it sweetened his soul. That's what we're talking about. Listen to these verses, verse 16. And it says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, even the ones you don't like, by the way. The one a minute ago you wouldn't say amen to, yes, and all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Guess what? That's under the clause, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Here's the reason why, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every, not some, for every good work. You and I must recommit ourselves to what we we know is true. Number two, we must also recommit ourselves to who we know. To who we know to be true. Who is that? Jesus Christ. Listen to verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, here it is, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. In these last days, these perilous times, you and I must recommit recommit to the one that we know to be true and his name is Jesus Christ and his name is Jesus Christ he gave us in the midst of one of the most tumultuous times in the life of the disciples in the midst of their world being turned up obviously God is trying to get your attention right here so you might want to listen okay so here it is you ready even I didn't realize it was that important <laughs> but here we go Jesus said this in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, we're talking about knowing, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. 
The good news is this, ladies and gentlemen, that in these perilous times, in these last days, you and I know who to run to, and his name's Jesus Christ. And he is our way, he is our truth, and he is our life. He's all of those things for you and I. As we get ready to close out this message and to bring this gospel train into the station, I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. What specific ways am I living as a Christian example to follow? What specific ways am I living as a Christian example to follow? Spend some time with that question. I think you'll be surprised at ways that you are doing that. But I think God will show you in ways you should be doing that. That you should be being an example. I was reminded in my study this week, I, I was studying a lot this week of getting ready for Wednesday, Friday night youth, getting ready for this morning's message, tonight's message, pre-recording all of the messages for Wednesday night Bible studies while I'm gone. There was a lot of studies going on the last two weeks. And uh, I was reminded in the midst of all of this, something I'd forgotten about. But many years ago, I was preaching a revival in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, uh, a beautiful little city out in western Nebraska. I was there at First Assembly of God. And uh, there for the revival, I believe, if I remember, I was a Sunday morning service, might have been the evening service. Um, the pastor told me, he said, hey, Brother Jonathan said, uh, we've got this, uh, one of our deacon's sons, he was just a little bitty boy, about, about this tall, a little bitty kid, remind me, now my grandson and him seem so alike in my mind, but just young kid, you know, little boy, said that this boy is something else. He's got the hand of God on him, and uh, he can just spout off God's word. Uh, uh, he's not only that, but he knows how to explain it. He's actually quite a great little preacher. And I've asked him if he would just get up and share uh, these few verses, this, this chapter that he recently memorized, and talk about it for a minute. And I'm like, hey, that sounds awesome, you know. So he introduced the little boy, gave him the microphone. The little boy got up there, and he was so cute. Had his little suit on, you know. He just like looked like a little man, little tie on and everything. And he got up there with no Bible in his hand. And he quoted this, this entire chapter. It wasn't a long one, but it was nine or ten verses long. Quoted the entire chapter. And then began to preach. I mean preach. I mean, embarrassed me. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I, I felt the need to maybe step away and just tell the pastor, let him keep going and send me home, you know. Uh, br just brought it. It was, it was beautiful. I sat there on the front row and just cried listening to this young boy preach the word. It was only for a few minutes. Didn't go very long at all. After the service was over with, I was out in the foyer like I usually am at my table uh, where we sell all of our resources, preaching CDs, all that kind of stuff. And uh, this young boy came up to me and, and and he's just beaming and wanted to come up and shake my hand, you know. And I knelt down next to him and, and uh, to where I could be down on his level and shook his hand. And I said, boy, I said, what's your name? And I don't remember what it is now. But I said, you did such a great job today. I'm so proud of you. And he's just smiling, you know. I said, I'm just so proud of you. I said, listen to me, little man. I said, keep that up. And one day you'll be the next Billy Graham. And I remember he looked at me like, who's Billy Graham? <laughs> you know, and that was one of the first times I started getting a revelation that he's probably lived long enough that we're going to start running into generations that are raised up not knowing who he is, you know. And then I struggled a little bit because that was the best I had, just telling Billy Graham. And Billy Graham would be a great guy if some of you turn out to be one of someone like him, man, you're doing great, you know. He was a hero of mine in the faith, you know. And this young boy didn't know who that was. I really wanted to encourage this young boy. I knew that life's not always going to be this cute and nice to him. And I wanted to encourage him. I wanted to give him something to follow. I wanted him to, to see a living example of something that would stand out in his mind in the midst of the most difficult of times in his life that are certain to come of how he could stay on the right path in the right way, go in the right direction. And he flat out told me, he said, who's, who's Billy Graham? And I said, I said, he's a great evangelist. He's one of my heroes. And the boy just kind of looked at me like, oh. And then I looked at him right in the eyes. He's just staring at me. He's just locked in with me. He just, he was so in the moment. And I looked at him and I said this. I said, hey, little man. I said, let me tell you something. I don't want you to forget it. I said, you keep memorizing God's word. You keep preaching God's word. You keep sharing your faith. You keep being faithful to God. And one day... One day, you'll be a great preacher just like me. 
And that little boy put his head up in the air and he squared those shoulders back. And he said, really? And I said, even better. I said, you can do it. And as he ran away, I heard him yelling at his parents, I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be like him. And listen, folks, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the God that's in us. And God wants you to be that example for someone else as a reason to not give up and to not give in. That example of someone that says, I want to be like him. Paul said this, imitate me as I imitate Christ. There's nothing arrogant. If you're following Christ, he's the lover of your soul. He's number one in your life and you only want to glorify him. I hope, I beg that God has hordes of people that are following your example. But we need to live in that kind of a way. What ways are you living to be an example of Jesus Christ? Let's pray right now. Father, we love you and we thank you, God. There's no one we love more, God. We love you. You first loved us, God, by your son dying on a cross for our sins. But because we've now found him, not on a cross, still nailed to a cross, but we found him as a resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords, then now, Father, we are able to love you, God. And Father, I ask you that we would live as bright, shining examples of godliness that despite any persecution from this godless world we live in that comes against us, even maybe sometimes at the hands of demons themselves, God, Father, that we not just survive, but we rise victorious and we take lots of people with us, God, by our example. Let it be so, Father. Let it be so today. We need you in these moments, God. Let's stand. Chris is coming with us for us to worship the Lord. Will you take a little time in light of this message and worship God with us together?